All right, joining me once again here on The Matthew Filipovich Show is my good buddy, Steve Horn. Steve is an investigative journalist whose work has been seen in The Nation, The Guardian, Center for Media and Democracy, Alternate. He is a research fellow at The Smog Blog, which you can find at thesmogblog.com. You can also follow him on Twitter at Steve A. Horn. Steve, thank you so much for being on the show again. Good to be back on, as always. All right, so Steve, buddy, we have talked before multiple times on the show, I believe, about the dangers of transport transporting oil by rail, mainly things like trains exploding, bomb trains, there's spills, uh, but you actually have several new reports recently on oil by rail. Tell us all about them. Sure. Well, you know, there's two main things going on at the federal level with oil by rail that I've been writing about. There's more than that going on, obviously. But the two things I've been writing about are, one, uh, you know, the, the rule writing for uh, oil by rail regulations and the Department of Transportation. The, the other one is also related to the Department of Transportation. They issued an emergency order on May 7th to, uh, you know, make sure that the state level emergency responders know know what the routes of oil by rail are and know what the chemical chemical composition of the oil that's being carried in these trains uh, basically is so that they can react to if there are explosions or if there are derailments and spills. And so uh, both of them, there's been political contestation happening that's been pretty uh, enlightening. Uh, in terms of where the interests align and who the power brokers are. And they are um, basically, uh, you know, lots of lobbying going on here. So at the rule writing level, the first thing, and those are still being hammered out, and I think should be some proposals by the end of the year, uh, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs of the White House has basically been an open door for uh, lobbyists, executives, and um, just basically the industry to come in and say, well, we don't like these rules that you're proposing at the Department of Transportation, and here's what we think they should be. And so in the, pretty much about the past month and a half, I think in about 13 meetings, the Associated Press just picked up on this. So, I mean, I, I reported on it a little bit before them, but they wrote a story about it that came out yesterday on Sunday, which is good because now it's you know it's going to be syndicated in newspapers around the country, and so they picked up on the so the, the OIRA has a history of helping water down regulations, and that's troubling for all kinds of reasons uh, because of especially if you just look at what they were what what some of the things have been lobbying on have been so, so things such as they don't want speed limits, um, they <laughs> they don't want uh, they yeah they're trying to lobby against. Uh, <laughs> You know, manned versus unmanned trains. The biggest disaster was an unmanned train in Lac Megantic, Quebec, on July 6th of 2013. Well, they're actually trying to push to ensure that they don't always have to have the trains manned. But the biggest disaster of them all was from an unmanned train. And you know, they're, they're lobbying its things like, uh, you know, uh, safer braking systems. So it's really across the board they're lobbying against all any type of protections if you look at some of the papers they submitted at those meetings uh, to OIRA and and that's important but i think just as enlightening is that other thing that i that uh, i've been covering and that's that battle between states the federal government and the rail slash oil industry on uh, the routes and on uh, safety things, you know. Through before, the- before we get before before we get to the routes, I, I want to get to yeah. that though. I want, but I want to. I kind of want to reiterate here. It's like again, some of the things that they're asking for in these regulations, none of them seem crazy at all. These no. all seem very rational things that you would want, like speed limits. Oh, it's only safe for a train to go X miles an hour down this down this route. Uh, we shouldn't have. Uh, we should actually have people on the train. We shouldn't have Skynet controlling the train, kind of things like that. You know, really simple, simple stuff. But also the the idea of not knowing the chemical makeup of what's being transported, because that actually is really, really important. Not only um, if, say, there if one of these trains d- does explode, which they do a lot. These trains explode a lot. Like so, the first responders can actually know what uh, 
what what type of of uh, you know fire uh, t- t- how to actually put out the fire, or they should know. Oh wait a second, these are the chemicals that are being leaked into this water supply. There's lots of reasons where where we should this stuff should be very well known and very regulated because these accidents do happen a ton. Right, right, and so yeah, I mean, and then you can see like uh, you know. Sh- Sheets that they've been submitting to Ira, like the the economic costs of, of speed limits, <laughs> literally like a PowerPoint presentation given by the Association of American Railroads, which is like the American Petroleum Institute for the rail, railroad industry. And so, yeah, I mean they're they're lobbying against just very basic protections uh, that that the Department of Transportation may implement by the end of the year, and we'll see how it plays out. But it the troubling thing about those meetings is that there hasn't I think the thing to highlight number one is there hasn't been any uh, public interest representatives, any environmentalists, anyone from that sphere in these meetings. There's been 13 meetings with OIRA, and they've all been strictly with industry. So that's the only voice that they've been hearing out, at least in individual meetings that are documented by OIRA, which is pretty troubling. And I mean, it's troubling because OIRA's history has been exactly that. Um, It's been watering down rules on behalf of industry interests in the name of something they call cost-benefit analysis, which is this famous kind of uh, legal thing they do with uh, looking at the economic costs only from the industry perspective and then implementing rules that will hurt industry the least, not looking at cost-benefit at all from a you know, normal citizen's perspective. The economic cost of destroying the environment, blowing up cities, blowing up rail lines, uh, destroy, destroying, uh, destroying everything. Who pays the, for the, that? Co- the cost against that? Yeah, <laughs> who pays for that? Right? That's not part of the cost-benefit analysis f- from uh, the perspective of OIRA and the people who run OIRA. And, 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 and OIRA was a White House sub-office that was created actually by the Reagan administration in 1981, but it it's persisted uh, through both Republican administrations and Democratic Party administrations since then. So you did mention, and again, I'm talking to my friend, journalist Steve Horn, journalist for Desmog Blog, desmogblog.com. You mentioned the other side of this uh, that's that's interesting and troubling at the same time is what's happening on the state level. So tell us what's happening on the state level. Sure, that kind of gets into that chemical composition stuff that we, that has been brought up a little bit already, but... The other part of that is the routes and, you know, the state respo- emergency responders' right to know both the chemical composition and the routes of those trains that are carrying oil uh, obtained from fracking and shale. And so a lot of states, they're all, they're all okay with the people in the, the quote-unquote need to know getting that data. So that's the actual emergency responders on the front lines. Those people have the quote-unquote need to know under this federal statute they've been citing. But there's a whole other side of this, and that's, well, a lot of journalists and uh, you know environmental groups and uh, public interest groups are interested in knowing this stuff, too, through the open records laws. And, uh, you know, what companies like BNSF, Burlington Northern Santa Fe, uh, Union Pacific, and the other big, big uh, players in the rail industry have been saying is that while they don't have a quote unquote need to know, um, and that, that's sort of a different sphere of law, that's the right to know laws, the public records laws. And so lots of states have still uh, been taking the rail industry letters that they've been writing, the legal letters, and saying that this is sensitive security information and national security uh, risk <laughs> of you know releasing this stuff. And so some states have, have held out, uh, including uh, Nebraska until recently, uh, New York, Oklahoma. Um, there's a short, kind of a shorter list now than there, than there was before, but a lot of these states have finally forked over information. But this is you know, it's an ongoing thing where states are uh, kind of looking at, uh, you know, what is the rail industry saying about this? What's their legal argument? And um, how should they respond? A lot of states were pretty good about it right up front, including North Dakota, which is the epicenter of it. They were one of the first states to release this information. But it's just interesting that um, it's kind of the same thing as a cost-benefit analysis. It's like, you know, who from whose perspective? You know, from their perspective, they, they don't think that anyone has the quote-unquote right to know this information because they know that if people knew this information, they would be troubled by it. They knew that one of these trains was traveling through the backyards, so what, you know, now will just pop and uh, it's all in that, you know, the, 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 if only the first responders know it, it's not so much of a big deal. But if, if you know, the citizens at large know it, 
it becomes a pretty big liability from the industry's perspective. And so I think that that's, that's kind of reading between the lines why uh, they don't want uh, people to know this information. But so that's an ongoing battle right now. There's still states that have held out, and I expect that most states will fork it over. Eventually, it's only a matter of time.